the simplicity but complete functionality of this New Mexican style fire poker really inspired me. On a recent trip to Taos, New Mexico, I was inspired by a very simple but very functional fire poker, much like this one. Welcome to Black Bear Forge, where I hope to educate, inspire, and spark the imagination of anyone interested in the traditional art and craft of blacksmithing. Now, there were several pokers in the gallery that we were visiting at the time, and I think they were for sale because it was a gallery, not a museum, but they were all very old, they were all locally made, and none of them were the same. These were not mass-produced items, they were either made by a local smith as a one-off for somebody that needed one, or they were made by somebody who had a forge on their homestead, and they were making something just for themselves. What they all had in common is that they were about this long, and they had a long skinny taper and just a simple point on the end. You just don't see the the classic hook that we usually think of on a fire poker on any of the New Mexican pokers that I saw down there. Doesn't mean there weren't some that had it, it's just these didn't. The one that I liked the most had this nice simple twisted handle, it's made out of flat stock, and has a simple ring this I started with 24 inches of quarter inch by three quarter inch flat bar. These clearly were made by whatever they had on hand and simply suited the materials because they were all a little bit different. So if that's not what you have, do what you have and see what you come up with. But I've got that material on hand so let's go cut a piece. Now you could certainly cut this with a chop saw, band saw, angle grinder, hacksaw, the shear works wonderfully for this, so that's what I'm going to use. Now I've been working in the gas forge today, so I'm just going to go ahead and do this in the gas forge. You could certainly do it in a coal forge. Now in my mind, one of the key features that makes this such an elegant poker, in spite of being a fairly simple piece, is this long, graceful taper. This is about 18 inches in the one that I've done as a sample, and I used a little over half the bar. So I'm using about 14 inches of the bar and drawing that out to about an 18 inch taper. A little more, a little less. Again, you don't have to make it match exactly this. It's a one of a kind project in most cases. So we're going to heat the bar up. Now if you leave the handle in longer until you do this taper, you won't need tongs, but otherwise a pair of quarter by three quarter box jaw tongs is the ideal pair of tongs for this. It's a good place to work over the horn of the anvil. Try not to let it turn into a big square bar while you're doing this. So you're going to need to work the flat some to keep it about a quarter inch thick. It's okay if the tip gets a little larger than quarter inch square by the time you get down there. But I want to establish this point first. Then we'll draw back from there until we get the taper we want. Depending on how big your fire is, you'll take lots of short heats. You probably won't get the whole thing done in one heat anyway, so there's not a lot of reason to feel like you need to heat the entire piece. At that very end, except for a final cleaning up and smoothing, is pretty much what we want. It pays to kind of keep it straight. Well, straight in one profile, tapered in the other profile. And as we get further up, the horn will start to become too aggressive. But I think we can do another heat or two through this area on the horn. One of the things I like about this design, or style maybe, is that it is just basic blacksmithing. It's drawing a taper. That's really the major skill involved with this. 
So it's a good skill builder to work these long tapers like that. I like to knock the corners off a little bit as I go, just so it doesn't have sharp edges. I think it feels better in the hand. Now I think we're going to do the rest of this up on the face of the anvil, otherwise I'm going to get too carried away there. Just look at this continually and make sure what you're doing is not ending up with a series of little parallel spots separated by steps. You want it to be a fairly smooth regular taper. The ones that I saw were quite nicely done. Clearly the smith was skilled. Even though the design was simple, the smith was not. We're getting close, so it's time to start worrying about all the little lumps and bumps and odd hammer marks and whatever else you may have left in it at this point. And again, I'm going to knock the sharp edges off. And the black heat, all I'm really doing is kind of smoothing. You don't want to try and do any real forging at this point. It helps knock the scale off means you don't need to wire brush it if you do this. Or at least you won't wire brush it as much. You can do a little straightening. But you're not really drawing out anymore. So we've taken that up to about 15 inches now. So I want to go back just a little bit further. Having the gas forge with a long heat does help even out any irregularities or steps in the, the taper as you try to draw it out a little bit longer. That's getting pretty good. It's straight. The taper's fairly even. And we're up to 18 inches. So now I'm going to let this cool. And I'll probably just let it air cool. But at, if it gets down to black heat for mild steel, you could go ahead and quench mild steel at a black heat. Next thing I want to do is put this little ring handle on here. Just something to hang it from. Very simple. start at the edge of the anvil. I'm going to line it up with the edge of my hardy hole and use that as a constant measurement if I make more of these. I'm using the side of my hammer face like a fuller and that's a way to cross peen this without having to stick your hand right over the hot material but this works as well. I just need to draw that out. So you can use the corner of a hammer if it's properly dressed. This is a kind of a square faced hammer, a round faced hammer. This wouldn't work as well. But you can use that to draw this out. Or you can use the peen. And you can do it over the horn. On my sample piece, I started off at the edge of the hardy hole and I drew it out until it came to the edge of the anvil. So if I want to make multiples, which isn't necessarily the point of this, but if I want to make multiples I will repeat that same process. It is fairly common to use your anvil for relative measurements. The exact dimensions don't matter but they are always constant on your anvil. 
not based on my anvil and your anvil aren't going to be the same, but my anvil is always constant. So if I make repetitive projects and use various dimensions on the anvil to measure, I get repetitive results. In this case, it's an inch and three quarter to the edge of the hardy hole, and overall it's five inches wide. I do this, I'm letting it spread this way. I'm not worried about keeping that at a quarter of an inch, and that is consistent with the original that I saw. I'm not going to let it spread a lot, but if this quarter inch bar spreads to three eighths, that's probably pretty good. That's just one of the characteristics of the original. Some of the pokers that I saw at this gallery had little curly cues on the end. The one that was done this way did not, so I'm not putting one on here. I do want to try and keep the bulge going this way symmetrical on the handle. I think one more heat will get it. We're only about a quarter inch short. And by the time I get this nicely tapered and take some of the flat spots out, I will pretty much gain my quarter of an inch that I want. I'm going to just lightly knock the corners off in the area that is right below this. I think that's pretty good. Well, let's make a ring out of it. We'll just start by putting an offset on this to get the ring started and then we'll go to the, the horn. So doing this freehand over the horn is another good exercise that makes this such a good project. Remember the horn isn't a perfect circle, so you're going to need to kind of work this around in different positions. So you get a perfect circle. I'm pretty happy with that. I just want to straighten this up, get everything in line as much as I can. I'll have a little bit more opportunity to do this after we twist the handle. So the next thing I want to do is blend in my chamfered edge up to up the handle a little bit, a little heavier down here, but fairly light where the twist will be to help maintain kind of a crisp edge. But not so crisp that it feels sharp. If you're worried about damaging your little ring you put on there, you could do all this first. You can also quench the ring if you want to to make sure it's not going to get messed up too much there. That just helps blend that taper into the part that's going to be left parallel. I think before I twist it, I would like to put my touch mark on it. And I just like to do that under the treadle hammer because it's just so darn easy. But you don't need a treadle hammer to do this project. We'll just put this in the vise. And we'll 
give it a twist. Now these flat bar twists like to get kind of whippy on the ends. The end doesn't like to stay in line because the bar just doesn't like to twist evenly. So it's worth uh, keeping an eye on it and don't go too far or it gets even worse. If it isn't perfectly straight, you can do some straightening right here in the vise just by a gentle squeeze. But I think we're in pretty good shape here. Just one last heat for a final little light straightening. And if you need to straighten that twist out, you can do it on a wood stump with a rawhide mallet or a wooden mallet. But this one came out very nicely. Well, here we have a poker. Or should I say a happy little poker? Because some people tell me they, that I remind them of Bob Ross. If you don't know who that is, you'll have to go look him up. But anyways, we got our happy little poker. Um, very simple, very basic, very light adornment. The twist is as much functional to make for a larger grip on the handle surface as it is ornamental. Nothing but basic blacksmithing skills. There's no filing, there's no grinding, there's no torch work, there's certainly no plasma cutting, arc welding, but milling, lathe work, none of that stuff in here. It's forge, hammer, anvil, a little bit of work done at the vise, and however you want to cut it off, which you could do hot on a hot cut at the anvil and not need a saw or chair or anything like that. Very basic, very good project, also very practical. I feel it's very elegant. I think there's a real charm in this New Mexican ironwork. I'd like to do a lot more of it. And there's lots of inspiration in Taos, which is where we were at Tres Estrellas Gallery. I think it's a gallery. And they don't really specialize in ironwork. It's more about weavings and tapestries. But they do have some ironwork. They even had some really nice knives and a few muzzle loaders that were available there. And I think most of it's for sale. Now, I think they are a for profit gallery. This is not museum quality work. It's not stuff that really belongs in a museum. It's stuff that's been in private collections and gets passed from one collection to another through galleries like this. But between there and other places in Taos, there is a lot of interesting ironwork. Generally, it's fairly simplistic, but has that charm about it, that New Mexican charm that really I, I like quite a bit. And I think we're going to do more of this. I think I will create a playlist that is either New Mexican ironwork or Taos-inspired ironwork or Taos, New Mexico. I don't know. We'll do something like that. And from time to time, we will do a project based on something that we've seen down there. My wife and I go down there quite regularly. She markets her rugs that she weaves through a, a place down there called Weaving Southwest. And that's the reason we go down there quite often is to take a rug down to Weaving Southwest or to buy yarn or she goes to another little town or some of the other places that spin and dye wool so she can buy yarn for her weaving. So we're down there quite a bit and I always have to look at the ironwork. I've seen most of it before but the these pokers that I saw in the gallery I had never seen before. That was the first time I'd ever been in there We'll be going back. I'll see if I can get permission to actually do a little video in there and show you some of the other very simple, very functional ironwork. There was a trivet made out of horseshoes, and no, it didn't look like horseshoes anymore. It looked just like any other round trivet. But if you look close, you can still see the, the fuller lines and the pritchel holes for the nails and that might be a fun one to do. It'll involve some forge welding to make a full circle out of a couple of horseshoes, but I think we can do that. Anyways, I've talked long enough. I hope you enjoyed the video. Give it a thumbs up. Love it if you'd hit that subscribe button if you haven't done that already. Hitting the subscribe button's free. You don't have to, to pay anything to subscribe. I hope you can watch some of the other videos. Make time in your day to get out to the shop, work on something, be inspired by something you've seen somewhere else, but do stay safe, do wear your safety glasses, and we'll see you for the next one.
Just a parting shot at the finished pokers.